I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. We're continuing our Just Jesus series. We're looking at practical wisdom from God to us. And our text is going to be Luke chapter 12 today. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, that's okay. Grab one of the few Bibles, turn to page 1108, and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 12, our passage today, which begins at verse 22. By the way, if you need a Bible and you don't have one, uh, you want to read God's Word, then take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read it, because we know if you do, it will change your life. Uh, so does anyone here ever uh, worry or get anxious uh, at all? Yeah, every service. A lot of people raise their hands, a lot don't, but there's a lot of giggling going on, because of course we worry. So what do we worry about? Do you worry about your finances? You know, are you going to have enough money to pay the bills? Are you going to be able to fix the car? Are you going to be able to, you know, put food on the table? What about sending the kids to college and paying for that? Or saving for retirement? Or are your investments going to do okay? So we worry about money. And sometimes we worry about health, right? A am I going to get sick? Or I'm sick, am I going to get well? What are the tests going to be? You know, how's that going to work out? And, you know, am I getting close to dying? Some of us really worry about that, that end-of-life stuff. And I know some of us are so consumed with our health worries that we go home at night, we Google on WebMD, and we convince ourselves we're dying of everything. <laughs> and some of you aren't laughing. You're like, that's serious. I am dying. No. And, and then, of course, we worry about our children, our grandchildren, right? Their safety, their health, their, their well-being. Are they going to be a success? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to fit in? Are they going to be a leader? Are they going to end up an addict or in prison? We worry about our kids and their future. On the broader spectrum, we worry about the world and the, the conflicts that are out there and what might happen and terrorism and, oh, my goodness, all those things. And in our country, we've got an election that's going on, and we worry about that, and we worry about the, the economy. What's going on with that? We worry. That's why, as a nation, we consume uh, anxiety meds like candy because we're afraid. And Jesus addresses our worry. He shares practical wisdom that will change our lives if we will listen to him and apply what he teaches. Luke chapter 12, verse 22, Jesus is talking to his disciples and it says, And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? And consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor to be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So there you have it. Really uh, succinctly, Jesus uh, says, don't be anxious. So we'll just all stop worrying, right? Yeah. yeah. So if, if so, then the shortest sermon ever. We're done. Let's go now. <laughs> Except that doesn't work for us. We still worry. So what I want us to do this morning is to really dive into this passage and figure out why and how Jesus says, don't worry, don't be anxious, so that we can live a life with less anxiety and more faith. So first of all, it begins by Jesus inviting us to trust him. Jesus invites us to trust him. I mean, he is addressing people living in poverty, real poverty, third world poverty, not American poverty. You know, a lot of times we talk about the poor people around us, and uh, I was reading a, a study done a few months ago that said that the average standard of living for people who are below the poverty line in America today is above where middle class lived in the 1960s in America. 
that the, what they have, the conveniences of life, the comforts of life, exceeds that. That's amazing. See, when we talk about poor in America, it's a whole different standard than poor in the world. Jesus is talking to people about what they're to eat and what they're to wear because these are people who are living on the edge of survival. They were going hungry. They were wondering if they were going to be able to have enough food, if they were going to have enough clothing to protect them from the elements. This was life and death. And to them, Jesus said, look, God knows your needs. Trust God to take care of you. Don't be anxious for those things. And and by the way, Jesus says, how does worrying help? You know, did you, did you catch that? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? You can't. So what's the point? Does worrying ever change anything for the better? <laughs> Does it? No, it doesn't. I, I mean, worrying never brings you peace, contentment, and joy. <laughs> so Jesus, instead of worrying, invites us to trust him. And, and by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ... If you believe that Jesus is actually the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you are already trusting him. Think about it. You're trusting Jesus to forgive you of all your sins. You're trusting Jesus to take you to heaven when you die. So you confess to him and say, okay, you're going to make me clean, and you're going to give me eternal life. And you're trusting Jesus at that, but he doesn't want that to be where the trust stops. He wants us to trust him more. He wants us to trust him with the unknown, if you will, the outcomes. Or to be really blunt, he wants us to trust him with the future, because that's what we don't know, right? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen with my job? What's going to happen with my family? What's going to happen with my kids? What's going to happen in the world? You see, God knows the future. We don't. And God wants us to trust him with the future. Have you ever thought to try and know the future is to try and play God? It's to do his job for him. Uh, That's why things like horoscopes and fortune telling and palm reading and seances and Ouija boards, they offend God. That's why he tells us not to do them. Because those are all means of trying to discern the future and to know what's going to happen and to understand the outcome before it gets there. And God says, I don't want you knowing that stuff because that's not for you. I know the future. Think about this. God knows every one of our days before one of them came to be. He knows our future. And what he wants you and I to do is to trust him with the future. To trust him with it. Say, okay, God, you're, you're there, you're ahead of me, you're going to take care of me when we're there, and you've promised us a glorious future one day. So Jesus wants us to trust him when he leads us, and when we disobey, he wants us to trust him to redeem our lives, restore us, and heal us. We might as well trust him because the truth is, we can't control outcomes anyway. Have you lived long enough to figure that out? You know, you want something to turn out this way, and you worry about it, and you try to make it happen, and it doesn't happen. We don't control the outcomes. You know what we control? Literally, you and I each control our own choices. That's it. That's what you have the power to control in your life is your choices. So here's the counsel that Jesus offers. If all you control is your choices, then make the choices that align with Jesus. Make the choices in your life, every single time when you're confronted with that, that are going to reflect the glory of God, the values of God. Because you will never go wrong choosing character. You will never have any regrets if you say, God, I chose to honor you. I'm telling you, how many times do we try to control stuff and we regret because we compromise our convictions trying to get an outcome? Jesus says, look, you can't control it, so trust me with it. And I'll take care of it. That makes a lot of sense if you're thinking about it. So Jesus wants us to trust him with the unknown. And he wants us to trust him with our possessions. Notice he's talking about food and clothing. Basics. Possessions. If we're honest, we worry about stuff. Right? We worry about getting stuff. Got to work hard. Got to get this. Saving for this. Trying to get it. We worry about having stuff. Is it the right stuff? Did you buy the right car? Did you make the right investment? And then we worry about losing stuff. Right? Well, if I have it, somebody else is going to want it. They're going to take it. So what do we do? We build houses for our stuff. We call them garages because somehow that eases our conscience. You know, and then, and then we run out of space there, so we rent storage units for our stuff to live in. 
And then that's not enough, so we got to put, you know, locks on the, the houses for the stuff. And then we got to have security systems, and then we got to buy more ammo, right? Because <laughs> we're worried about losing the stuff that we got. And Jesus just explains it so easily. Trust me with your possessions. Why? Because God feeds the stupid birds, <laughs> right? And God clothes the brainless flowers, And you are worth more than the stupid birds and the brainless flowers. And if he took care of them, he's going to take care of you in this life and the next. And then Jesus provides this counsel. If you continue reading at verse 32 in Luke 12, it's just a continuation of thought. Jesus says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus says, look, why don't you make eternal investments instead of temporal ones? Be generous. Be good stewards. And invest in something where there is no risk and there is an eternal reward. Wow. See, the truth is, if your life is wrapped up in what you own, then anxiety will be your constant companion because you'll always be afraid. Um, So trust God with your possessions and trust Jesus with your relationships. Relationships. We trust God with your spouse, with your kids, with your parents. Uh, I have this theory. Um, know why I think God tells us to love each other so much in Scripture? I mean, Jesus is always talking about love, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors, yourself. Love your enemies. Um, you know, love one another as I've loved you. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Kind of, kind of says it over and over and over again. And of course, throughout Scripture, God tells us to love. Why is that? I think he does that because we're so bad at it. Right? Okay, you got little kids, and, and you know, you're trying to teach them manners, and, and so if somebody gives them something, whether it's a piece of candy or a gift, and, and what are you always telling them? Say thank you. Say thank you. Say thank you. <laughs> right? Because they, they don't want to do it. They, they have to learn. And so you're trying to remind them of, of what your basic good behavior is. I think that's what God's doing with us. He loves us, and he wants us to love. And part of that love is trusting Jesus with our relationships. Think about it. God is our Father. Mission says several times in this passage, and I love that phrase, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Our Father loves us. Think about this. He has the power, but he doesn't control us or manipulate us. He just loves us. Henry Nouwen says that it's easier to control people than it is to love people. Isn't that amazing? We spend so much energy trying to control the people that we say we love. And God says, what I want you to do is love them like I love you. Love them like I love you. And so that means that we trust Jesus to care for our kids and our grandkids. We trust Jesus to care for our spouse. We trust Jesus to care for our family. And we follow his example and love like he loves. So Jesus invites us to trust him. But if we're going to trust him, we need to know what that looks like. And so I would submit to you that trust is active, not passive. Um, So often people get this crazy idea that trusting God means doing nothing. And I share that because I grew up in church where we talked about trusting God, and then we equated that with doing nothing and letting God take care of everything, and it didn't work. There was a lot of people who were just really good at sitting uh, in the church rather than, you know, uh, occupying the servants' quarters. And and so uh, I want you to know that I think that trust is active, not passive. That a passive faith is often a destructive faith. Uh, So I was writing that down. I thought of this illustration. It's an old one. Heard it in church when I was little. So a lot of you probably heard this. If not, then you'll be entertained. But there was this guy who lived by the river, and there was a flood coming. And uh, and his friend said, aren't you worried? He goes, nope, I'll trust God. Take care of me. And uh, pretty soon a policeman showed up at his door, knocked, and said, hey, we're evacuating this area. You need to get out. And the guy says, nope, don't worry about me. I trust God. He'll take care of me. The river rose. 
pretty soon he's on the second floor, and a guy comes up in a boat and says, hey, hop on the bo- boat. I'll take care of you. I'll rescue you. The guy says, nope, I'm trusting God. Take care of me. He'll take care of me. River rises. Guy's on the roof now. Sitting up there on the roof. Guy, a helicopter comes. Hey, we'll drop down the thing. We'll, we'll rescue you. Nope, I'm trusting God. Take care of me. I'm good. River rises. Man drowns. He gets to heaven. He's a little bit ticked, you know, because he's trusting God. He's like, hey, God, you let me down. You let me drown. And, and God says, my poor, stupid child. <laughs> I added some of this. So, um, I sent you a police officer, a boat, and a helicopter, and you turned them all down. Passive faith will lead you to destruction. You see, trust is active, not passive. It, we want you to read the Bible because when you do that, you'll learn how God works in this world. And, and everywhere in the Bible, trust involves acting, right? The, the father of the nation of Israel, Abraham. God says to Abraham, I want you to move to a land I, I, I'll show you when you get there. And Abraham didn't say, hey, God, send me the GPS coordinates. I'll put it in and I'll go there. No, he just packed up and moved. Didn't know where he was going. How about Moses? Moses, I want you to go lead my people out of slavery in Egypt. God never told Moses how he was going to do it. He just said, you show up, and I'll show up, and it'll happen. And Moses did it. How about David and Goliath? You know the story? Kid kills a giant, right? For 40 days, this giant had stood there challenging the army of Israel. And any one of those days, as he was insulting their God, God could have dropped a lightning bolt on Goliath's head and killed him. But he waited until someone showed up and said, Hey, I've got the trust in my God that he will take care of me. And David went out and killed the giant. How about Jesus? He looked at his disciples and he said, Follow me. Follow me. And they got up and left their boats. They got up and left their their table. They got up and left their job and their lives and they followed Jesus. It was was action, not passive. So what does trust look like for us? It means applying God's word to our lives, even when we're afraid to do it. It means hearing and obeying Jesus, even when life is hard. It means living out God's promises even when you don't see the results when you want to. Um, In short, trust is action based on belief. It's action based on belief. Um, If you're sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, here is a prescription I want you to take. This will make you well. If you trust the doctor, what are you going to do? You're going to take the prescription. If you're in legal trouble and you go to an attorney and you say, hey, what do I do? And they give you counsel. If you trust that attorney, what are you going to do? You're going to follow their counsel. So our life is not where we want it. And we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, help me. And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. If we trust Jesus, we will do it. We will apply his word to our lives. We will live out our faith. So today, are you actively trusting Jesus? My guess is the answer is yes and no. That that every one of us in this room are trusting God at some point in our life, but the truth is we need to trust God more. We need to trust God more. So let's talk about learning to trust God. Learning to trust God. Um, so here, I, I'm going to say a statement. If you agree with it, just uh, you, can, you can express that. We want to worry less and trust God more. True? Okay. We want to worry less, trust God more. Guess what? God wants us to worry less and trust Him more. So if we want the same thing that God wants, how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, there's not like this uh, miracle trust pill that you can take tonight and tomorrow morning you wake up and you'll trust God in everything. It doesn't work that way. You have to build the trust in your life through the habits that build trust. And so what I want to do is share with you four habits that you need, if you get into them, you will will grow trust in your relationship with God, and that trust will overflow in your life. And one day you'll wake up not too far in the future and go, wow, I can't believe how much I'm trusting God more than I used to. So four habits uh, that if you take these, you're going to build your faith and develop more trust. The first habit See God's power. See God's power. 
See God's power in creation, in nature, in weather, in beauty. Open your eyes to God's awesome power that's all around you. Don't just walk out and go, wow, what a great day. Recognize who gave that day to you. Recognize who made the mountains. Recognize who who gave us this this incredible beauty that's all around us. Praise him for it. And, and, And see his power in history. We want you to read the Bible because when you read the Bible, you will see God's power and how he worked redeeming his people. That's the story of Scripture, how God redeems his people. But don't just stop there. Read biographies of famous Christians and see how God worked in their life. And then see God's power in your life. Think back on your life and see how God has protected you and provided for you and redeemed you. I hope you can do that. I hope you can identify those times in your life when God showed up in powerful ways for you and your family. And by the way, if you struggle to be able to do that, sit down with somebody whose faith you respect and say, help me to, to look at my life and kind of identify those times that God was there. Because the more you do this, the easier it becomes to see God's power at work in your life. And once you identify how God has worked in your life, then tell the stories to your kids and your grandkids and celebrate God's faithfulness and power together. Praise him together and that will build faith in your family. So first of all, see God's power, and secondly, embrace his love. Now, we say God loves you and God loves us all the time. That's kind of one of those phrases in the church that is just commonplace. But do you really believe it? Because a lot of times we believe that God loves us, but we kind of think that God's angry at me. God doesn't like me. God's you know, frustrated with me. And, and the truth is that God loves me. God loves you. And he demonstrated that love in Jesus, in his death on the cross for you. That the sacrifice of Jesus is God's eternal declaration of love for you. In fact, Scripture says so. 1 John 4.10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. You see, God loved us first. God loved us best in Jesus. And every time we celebrate communion as a church, it's to remind us that God loves us. His broken body was broken for you. His blood for the forgiveness of sins was shed for you. It's personal. So God loves you and he wants you to embrace that love, to live in that love. And to help us do that, um, well, recognize that every single good thing in your life comes from God. Every single good thing in your life comes from God. So are you thanking God for the blessings in your life, or are you always complaining about what you don't have? You see, gratitude toward the one who's blessing us makes it easier for us to trust him for more. Trust him to meet our needs. Trust him at those points. In fact, When we know we're loved, it's easier to trust. And God wants us to trust him out of that relationship with him. That's why Jesus uses the phrase, your father, over and over and over again. You know, your father knows your needs. Your father wants to give you the kingdom because your father loves you. So who is the person in this world that you trust the most? Think about that. Who do you trust the most? And then why do you trust them? Well, you probably trust them because they're faithful, because they're encouraging, because you know they're going to take care of you, because they, they, you know, they'll sacrifice for you. All those things that, that make uh, somebody trustworthy. And here's the thing. God exceeds all of them. God loves you more. He cares for you more. He sacrificed more. He's, he wants to see you succeed more. He's there for you. I mean, that's why God wants us to embrace his love. The more you think about his love, the more that's going to build trust in your life. Third habit, hope in his promise. Hope in God's promise. See, God's promises can change our attitude if we live them out. Uh, Now, I want to just share with you two big promises that I think will will affect your day-to-day living and build trust in your life. First one is this. God has promised to be with us no matter what. God's promise is to be with us. Scripture says in Old Testament, New Testament, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And the reality of that is this. The moment you confess Jesus as Lord, God put the Holy Spirit in you. 
Now, he's in you to teach you, to comfort you, to encourage you, to convict you of sin. But he's also there to guarantee God's presence with you until the day that he takes you home. God's with you, which means whenever you're going through a day, you're never alone. God is with you, and he won't leave you. So the next time you're facing a crisis or a problem, try this. Try these two questions to help build your faith. Just say, okay, God, how do we get through this? How do we get through this? Not, God, how do I get through this? But, God, how do we make it through? Second question is, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do in the midst of this? Recognize that he is with you and he's for you and he's there redeeming your brokenness. Second big promise. First one is God's going to be with us. The second promise is that we'll be with him. The promise of heaven. The promise of eternal life. That because of Jesus' death and resurrection, when we die, uh, we're going to go and be with him. And because of that promise, we can live courageously, joyfully, encouragingly, because we know without a doubt that the best is yet to come. Now think about this. I'm not talking about the curmudgeonly old Christians that are kind of like, well, this world's, you know, it's just all terrible. It's all toast. It's going to hell in a handbasket. But, you know, heaven's promise, so we'll just go ahead and endure and suck it up. You know, those people are not fun to be around. And that's not what I'm encouraging you to do. What I'm encouraging you to do is to recognize that because of the promise of eternal life, because of our perspective, we can live life with hope. Every single day. Now, let me just confess. There's a lot of times when I'm reading the news, uh, when I'm hearing about what's going on, that I get frustrated, okay? I get frustrated with the direction of our country. I, it grieves me that we are rejecting the values of God that we are founded on, and as a nation, we're celebrating sin. Okay? That breaks my heart. But here's the thing. God never told me to place my hope in how great the United States of America is. God told me to place my hope in him and in his kingdom. And if I seek first his kingdom, then all this other stuff's going to be taken care of. And here's the thing. The kingdom of God, the same kingdom that the Father is delighted to give to us, can't lose. It's going to win. In fact, it's already won. And we're a part of the winning side. And God's will is going to be accomplished. And his mission is still before us. And we can be a part of that. So we can take hold of that and know that no matter how dark the days get here, the best is still ahead of us. It only gets better for us, folks. So if we live with that, it changes our attitude. And it allows us to trust God more. So hope in his promise. And finally, the fourth habit, seek his kingdom. Jesus told us that, verse 31. Instead, seek God's kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Seek first his kingdom. You know what I think that means? I think that means that we live on a mission. We live on a mission, God's mission, that we invest our lives in building God's kingdom, not our own. In short, serve others instead of being consumed with a selfish life. Serve others. Uh, in three weeks from today, we'll be worshiping in our new campus on Sweetwater. Yeah, that's something to celebrate, isn't it? We've been talking about this. And, and over a year ago, we started challenging you, saying, hey, when we get in Sweetwater, uh, we want to reach the 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. And the way we're going to do that is we want to see 4,000 guests in the first six months. And the way that that's going to happen is if you guys all bring three of your friends that don't go to church. And some of you have taken hold of that, and you're like, I've got to invite this person, and this person, and this person, and this person, because some of them will say no. And, and you've got a list, and you've already been working on it, you've already been talking to them about it. And others of you are like, that's a great idea. Here's the thing. When is God's mission going to become more important than your mission in your life? And some of you are going, well, you know, that's all well and good, but what does that have to do with anxiety? I'm glad you asked. I was talking with a professional counselor about this subject of worry and anxiety and fear, and she told me that the best way to overcome anxiety, this is what she recommends to her clients, best way to overcome anxiety is to focus on others instead of yourself. That if you will focus on others' needs instead of your fears, your anxiety will go down. And you know what I, I told her? I said, you know, that's really cool because that means that you're confirming what Jesus said. Jesus is right. Imagine that. That's why we're teaching his wisdom. 
He's right. When we follow him, when we serve others, when we invest our life in his mission, we have more peace, more joy, more contentment, and less anxiety, fear, and worry. In other words, purpose defeats anxiety. Being involved in God's purpose will defeat your fears. So what kind of life are you living? You live in a life of trust and faith, or you live in a life of fear and anxiety and worry? What kind of life do you want to live? Because Jesus invites us to trust him. Today, I'm challenging you to take the actions that will build up your faith rather than get consumed with those things that will tear it down. And the really cool part is we all have a choice to make about how we're going to live. Let's pray. Father, thank you.